and agriculture. We may know where the water out of our tap comes from, but we very seldom know where the water that went into our can of cola or into the shirt that we're wearing on our back, where, the, where those goods were produced and how much water it required and what the consequences were for the natural systems in those areas and for the local communities that are dependent upon that same water. So for example, the cup of coffee that you may have in the morning requires on the order of 120 liters just to produce the coffee um, and bring it to your table. Uh, a can of beer, 150 liters. Uh, a hamburger, 8,000 liters of water. Uh, to produce enough water to grow the cotton in my shirt is, is 3,000 liters as well. The impact of human demands on the world's freshwater systems are so massive, they can be seen from space. The Aral Sea, a freshwater lake in Central Asia, once covered 65,000 square kilometers. In the last 40 years, it has lost 90% of its water. The rivers that feed it diverted to irrigate cotton. Lake Chad on the southern edge of the Sahara has also been drained to a tenth of its former size by drought and overuse, yet 30 million people depend on it. It is possible to distill fresh water from the sea, and in the last 20 years, more and more countries have turned to desalination. But with current technology, Desalination plants are often extremely expensive, use an enormous amount of energy, and their byproducts can be damaging to our seas. With groundwater levels declining across the world, from North Africa to China, pollution of rivers and wetlands on the increase, and already today more than 1.2 billion people living with water scarcity, our prospects for providing water to nearly 3 billion more people do not look good. But in many ways, supplying water to people is the least of our worries. As we've seen, the lion's share of the water we use goes into agriculture, and that means any water shortages we face in the future will affect our ability to provide that other staple of life, food. When it comes to the world's food supply, some of the most accurate information comes from space. Geographer Molly Brown monitors food production on Earth using data from NASA's satellites. This is an um, ecosystem in Thailand where they do rice agriculture, and it's extraordinarily productive and in one of the most highly productive agricultural regions. Now she's beginning to see global agriculture hit a natural limit. One of the things that all these different landscapes really show us is how we are using almost all the land that's available to us that's really highly productive, that has great agricultural potential. And so that we know that, that there isn't a lot of extra land. I mean, we are using 30 or 40% of the entire land surface. As the world's population increases, the urgency with which we're going to have to increase the amount of food we produce will increase. And so we need to double the amount of food that we have available to us as soon as possible. How we're going to do that is through raising productivity, because there's really no more land with which to expand to. A doubling of productivity sounds ambitious. But we've done even better than that in the past. In the 20th century, the industrialized nations managed to triple their farming yields with the invention of synthetic fertilizers and then by the introduction of mechanized processes. The less developed parts of the world continued using traditional farming methods into the 1960s until an Iowan farmer decided to do something about it. Norman Borlaug, who died this year, aged 95, is credited with saving millions of lives in what's become known as the Green Revolution. So he was a very unpretentious man, and you can see from um, his office, small but very functional, and he had some of his 
awards on the wall, but also, uh, in particular, I always thought this picture which he kept on the wall was quite typical of uh, the kind of person he was, his interactions with the next generation of scientists around the world, and his enthusiasm for getting out into the field and showing people what could be done with the science in improving agricultural productivity. Borlaug developed high-yielding, disease-resistant crops and taught Indian and Mexican farmers how to get the most out of them with modern farming methods. The astonishing five-fold increases in yield that they achieved allowed many countries to become self-sufficient in food. In 1970, Borlaug received the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in alleviating world hunger. He was able to get his wheat, his new varieties, delivered to India, and within a few years, it was really astounding. He showed me pictures of the mounds of wheat, the surplus that had been produced within a few years of introducing these new varieties. And in fact, that's the, the seminal event, that's the Green Revolution. Thanks in part to Borla, much of the world is now fed, but globally we're beginning to see a leveling off of agricultural yields. This is leading to a worrying new trend. To maintain their own food supplies, some of the richest and most powerful countries in the world are acquiring large tracts of land from some of the very poorest. Bolivia de Scuta is a human rights lawyer who has been monitoring these land deals for the United Nations. Arable land suitable for cultivation is becoming a scarce commodity and countries find it more and more difficult to produce enough food to feed their population. So they are now scrambling in a global competition to achieve food security by buying land abroad. International corporations and increasingly governments are leasing some of the last remaining areas of undeveloped farmland in the world. Their aim is to introduce intensive farming methods and export the food back to their home countries. Well, the problem is that in most cases, these deals are not sufficiently well monitored. They are not transparent, and we are not certain that local communities will benefit from these investments. These deals are often controversial and shrouded in secrecy. But according to local media reports, Chinese investors are negotiating land deals throughout Africa, as well as with Kazakhstan, Mexico and Brazil. Saudi Arabian firms have leased farmland in Sudan. And several British investment funds are reported to be raising capital to buy farmland in Angola, Malawi and Ukraine. Most of the target countries for foreign investors are in Africa, some of which already struggle to feed their own people. Well, we see paradoxical situations such as foreign investors producing food in Ethiopia, shipping this food back to the home country or selling it on the international markets, when Ethiopia is still a country which is heavily dependent on international food aid. So this is a country which is at the same time producing food for export markets and depending on international aid in order to feed this population. The future is going to be particularly challenging for the countries of sub-Saharan Africa. With many of their populations projected to double, there's going to be increasing pressure for a limited supply of land. There are few nations as acutely aware of how destabilizing these kinds of pressures can be as Rwanda. Our land is not growing, and yet our population is. We estimate that it will be double by in, in, in 26 years. So in 26 years, we probably will be 20 million. 